Anybody love Tosh in the house? Anybody love that dude? This guy's next level. I mean, if you get close to Tosh, he's one of those guys that, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to be loved and, and revered from the, from the pulpit. It's another thing to be loved in your home, and those that are closest to you have the most respect for you. And that is Tosh in a nutshell. The closer you get to Tosh, the more respect you have for that man. And so I'm just thankful for your, your willingness to be a part. He's going to be preaching part two of this series uh, uh, called Because of Jesus, We Are family, which is something that God uh, had placed on my heart a few years ago. And it started out in student ministry, and then it spilled over into just like everything that God gives growth to. It spills over and begins to influence everything else. And, and we're at this place now as a church to where like, let's just, it, let's, it, it is the entirety of Praise Church is this uh, foundation of Because of Jesus, We're Family. So I'm going to be talking about that, but listen, I got to first give a shout out. I'm in a good mood tonight. I'm just in a good mood, right? You don't have to be to come to church, but I'm saying I'm in a good mood right now because I know where I'm going and my, I'm with Jesus. Jesus, and I know that my Alabama Crimson Tide are national champions right now. So I got like, I got my eternal hope, and we're good. And my temporary hope is good as well. So uh, <laughs> so I'm having fun tonight. It's going to be good. Um, but more than that, you know, I, I start every, every year. Um, you know, as a pastor, it's, it's my job to lead you. I start every year just kind of in this place of, God, where are we going in 2018? I never know where we're going. Where are we going? And uh, it's like, where are we going to go in 2018? And just spending that time in prayer. And it is just, when I get to be alone with God, I got to go to the beach. Someone donated a beach cabin. I got to spend three days there by myself without any other human interaction. It was awesome. And uh, even though I'm a super extrovert, uh, it's just, uh, when it's just me and God, it was great. And I am excited about what is going to happen in 2018. And I want to help you get to that place where you're going to be excited about it as well. And just being a part of what's happening at PYA is a huge part of that. And uh, there truly is uh, just such... Um, thank you guys for being here. Let me just say that. You guys cool with that? Let's pray, and then I want to I get into what I believe God had placed on my heart for us here this evening. So God, this is all for you. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of, of bringing your kingdom come on this earth. God, help us to, help us to see um, others the way that you see them. God, help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. And God, let that love motivate us. Um, and God, give us life and life to the fullest. So God, we love you. We praise you. We love Jesus. Amen. So this morning, I woke up. I didn't go to bed till like 2.30. I watched as much Alabama coverage as I possibly could and late into the night. I woke up, and I love when you're in those moments to where, and, and I preach this all the time, but, you know, people ask, how do you hear God? And, and a lot of it is just, you just got to position yourself to be so close to him that you can hear him whisper. And there's a teaching where God, or Jesus, who, who I believe is God, he's teaching his disciples as recorded in the, the Gospels, and he says, what God reveals to you in secret, I want you to proclaim in public. And, and this morning, I felt God speak to me just so sweetly in my heart and say, I want you to share the story of your friend from high school. I'm like, God, that's a difficult story to tell, but it's a true story. And the story is a, it's a, it's a friend of mine that I had in high school who at best was socially awkward and at worst, he was called retarded. He was a, he was a guy who was never going to go to Harvard for his smarts. He was never going to play in the pros for, for his athletic abilities. He was never going to be in a band for how good he was at, at singing. And we even coined the phrase talk singing because next to him in church, he talked the lyrics somehow instead of singing them. I don't, he didn't ever understand it. Um, and he was never going to be this obvious from the outside looking in, just this obvious person. But in my interaction with him, his laugh would light up a room. In my interaction with him, he was one of the most loyal friends that I ever had in my entire life. In my interaction with him, I knew him to have one of the most purest hearts of anybody that I'd ever encountered. And me and, and me and my friends, and this is going to go on YouTube, that's why I'm not using the name, but uh, me and my friends, we didn't have anything in common, really. From the outside looking in, he was huge into fishing. 
And up until a few years ago, because I preached it since I moved to Southeast Texas, I had never caught a fish in my entire life up until like last year, right? I know I'm in Southeast Texas. Don't shun me off the stage or whatever. But and he was huge into fishing. He even, has a, uh, he even has a tattoo that says, the pursuit of life, liberty, and the big bass, all right? That's his tattoo that he has on his body. And this dude loves fishing. I had never, I, I tried to fish. I just, I'd never caught a fish. And I'm huge, in the, I'm huge in the college sports, right? Obviously, you could tell. But he was all into professional sports. And so all of my football watching time happened on Saturdays, and his happened on Sundays. And, and I came from a family where both my parents loved God, and, and, and he came from a broken family where there was a lot of brokenness happening in that. And, and, and so him and I, from the outside looking in, we didn't have really, we were very uncommon. But we had one thing in common. It's because of Jesus we were family. And that one thing was a bond that was so special that I don't think that if it was for Jesus, and I'll be honest in my own humanity, I never would have given this friend, I would have never given this guy the time of day because we were so different. We, we had ran in the different circles and, and I never would have given him, I never would have even noticed him or even seen him or even understood him. And, and it's because I never would have noticed him that when I did because of Jesus, I noticed how many other people didn't notice him. And when my, my heart was broken for my friend because I watched how he consistently would sit at the end of a table and people would never go out of their way to sit next to him. They would sit next to the people they knew and he would consistently be on the outside looking in and my heart would break. I would notice how he would struggle with the, his parents going through a divorce and he would have no one to reach out to because nobody wanted to be with him. I noticed how he knew that people were making fun of him and calling him half retarded. I noticed how, how when other people weren't noticing the fact that, yeah, he did walk a little differently than everybody else, but he knew that people were snickering and, and making fun of him. And because I noticed him because of Jesus and how he had, Jesus had changed my heart, I noticed how no one else did in his life. And you may hear a story like that, a story of, of, of that relationship, and you may think, man, man, that's so sad. How could they immediately I would never do that. How could they? But if I'm honest, the default condition of the human heart is self-centered. The default condition of our human heart is self-centered. And if we allow ourselves to live by default, we will allow ourselves to always sit to the, next to the same person every time we go to church. To always go out to eat with the same person that we always go out to eat with every time we go out to eat. To always invite that same person to go to the movies with us that we always go to the movies with. And it may not be in and of itself a bad thing, but when it becomes a pattern of how to be comfortable with you and yours, and you forget the marginalized, the widows and the orphans, you forget the people that society has left behind, it becomes self-centered and you get into a place by default, whether I don't believe it's many of our intentions, but we get to a place and all of a sudden life revolves around me and what's most comfortable for me. Before and after service, you talk to the people that you know. And I'm just talking about the context of this right here. Let's apply that to all the different social circles in our lives. And, and today I want to talk about this, this beautiful promise that Jesus gives us, that this beautiful promise that all who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God and that God wants a deep, meaningful relationship with us. But the truth of the matter is, is God wants us to have deep, meaningful relationships with other people as well. And the default condition of the human heart is self-centered. And so that's why I wanted to share that story at the outset. And this isn't a they problem. If you're honest with yourself and if I'm honest with myself, it is a me problem. Amen? Anybody with me on that? Anybody else feeling like, gosh, I'm a little too selfish in my own life. And I don't believe that many of it is by intent. I don't think many of you are in here saying, I'm purposely self-centered. I'm purposely prideful. I'm purposely better than everybody else. But I think that it's a matter of I'm uncomfortably self-centered. I'm uncomfortably prideful. You know what I mean? To where it is harder for you to not be self-centered. It's hard for you to be selfless. And so tonight, I want to start this, this, this uh, year off, really, this little bit series off by saying, how can I... A, comfort somebody in this room who's afflicted. 
who when I tell that story, you play the role of the friend. And then I also want to afflict the comforted. That you're in here and you're saying, well, I've never experienced a lot of that before, but how's God moving me? And let's find that middle ground here tonight. So I have a big question that is, is a good question for this, is are you living by default or are you living by design? I had the opportunity of preaching Sunday at Praise a few weeks ago, and I brought up this question, and it is my question for 2018 for my own personal life. And you may hear me preach this a lot because it's gonna be something that I'm going to journal through every single day of, of 2018, just personally for myself. It's saying, am I gonna live by default or am I gonna live by design? Because if the default mode of the human heart is to be self-centered, then the designed, how God designed us is to be selfless, is to be others centered. Let me show you this because Matthew 22 and Mark chapter 12 are two books that were written, historical documents of the account of the events surrounding Jesus's life. So these are historical documents. We call them gospels because they are good news to us, good news of what Jesus has done. And both Matthew and both Mark uh, record this moment to where a lawyer comes up to Jesus and says, uh, he's trying to trick him, you know, because lawyers are, you know, kind of like that. Wait, am I marginalizing society when I say that? Dang it. Anyway, but, but the lawyer comes up and says, uh, tries to, you know, quiz Jesus a little bit. And he says, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in this entire Bible? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds with, maybe you know this. It's tattooed on my arm. Love God and love others. The greatest thing you could do with your life. He literally says, the entirety of the scriptures, all the law and all the prophets, hang on these two concepts. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others as yourself. Love others in that, in that way that you default to loving yourself. Shift that from you to others and love other people the way that you wish you were loved. The way it's so easy for you to think about yourself, shift that and love others in that way that's so easy for you to love yourself. And so when I say because of Jesus we're a family, it is my way of just saying God wants a deep, meaningful relationship with you. He wants to call you, he wants you to call him dad. He wants you to call him father, saying this is the deepest relationship. So basically, what's that mean? That means love God. It's my way of saying the most important thing we can do is have a deep, meaningful relationship with God. Love God. But then because of Jesus, where a family means love others. Because the entirety of the scriptures hangs on those two concepts. God wants us to have deep, meaningful relationships with others, right? So it's my way of leading, and God, I say my way, it's God's way of, of leading us to say, are you developing deep, meaningful relationships with God and with each other? And we must recognize that nowhere in that command does it talk about living self-centered. Nowhere in that command does it talk about what's best for me. In fact, if you, if you look through scriptures, like probably the central and the most, uh, the integral concept for you understanding what it means to live for Jesus comes from Matthew chapter 10 and also Matthew 16. But let's read Matthew chapter 10 um, first. It's whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This is Jesus teaching. And whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now let's really think through this and in, in, in basically how, how Jesus is teaching us not to be self-centered in our thinking. How to be others-centered in our thinking. God and others-centered. He's saying, if you deny this teaching, right? If you deny this, leave that on the screen, I'm sorry. If you want to, Matthew chapter 10, put that back up there for me, that'd be great. He says, if you do not take this cross, so if you deny this teaching, and that means you take up yourself, meaning you were put on self-centeredness, this is about me and not about Jesus, you will what? Lose your life. So whoever finds his life will lose it. But he's saying, you need to lose yourself in me. You need to give me complete control of your life. And then what will happen? You will find it. He says it again. He's teaching another time and helping them in Matthew 16. Uh, it's a few chapters later, but it's, a, it's a, a little bit of a time period later where Jesus is teaching this again. He tells his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he flips it this time. He says, deny yourself and take up this cross. And what's going to happen? Whoever would, 
Yeah, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So he teaches it two different ways. If you deny Jesus and, and focus on yourself, you actually lose yourself. But if you deny yourself and take up Jesus, you will actually find yourself. Is anybody confused? You guys got that? I know that's kind of back and forth a little bit, but put a little bit of mental effort into that and you'll really begin to see um, what Jesus is trying to say here. He's trying to say, whoever wants to give, deny yourself and put on me and give your identity to me, you will actually find yourself. It kind of is a little bit backwards, but to ask yourself, am I living by design or am I living by default? The first thing you need to ask yourself every day is, how can I deny myself today? Because it's, it's, the, it's the human heart. You're going to wake up and you're immediately going to think, what's best for me? What's best for me today? And if you were to wake up with that mindset of saying, I'm not living by default today. Not what's best for me. What can God do through me today? Right? How can I connect myself to Jesus? How can I love others? How can I be others-centered, not self-centered today? I love the way that the message puts this. So I'm going to reread Matthew 10 via the message. He says, it says this in the paraphrase that really helps us connect to this. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. And I think what I'm trying to help us understand is that maybe again, not by intent, but by default, by not actively asking ourselves these questions, we can find ourselves falling back into this place of saying, what is best for me? What relationships are best for me? What is best for me? Rather than thinking, how do I be not self-centered, but God and others centered in all of my thoughts and everything that I do. And here's what I was trying to think. And, you know, C.S. Lewis has popularized that um, quote about the definition of humility. Does anybody know that off the top of their head, right? Humility is not thinking less of yourself, like, oh, woe is me, but doing what? Thinking of yourself less, right? Well, so basically another way to say that is humility is thinking about others more, right? Humility is thinking about others more. So when you come into a situation, when you come into something and you see people around you, you're not thinking, what is best for me in this moment? You're thinking, who needs my love in this moment? Who needs, uh, who, who wants, who, where is there an opportunity for me to be Jesus to someone else right now? How can I speak life into somebody? How can I pour myself out into somebody around me right now? How can I think of myself less and think of others more? I truly believe that this is the key to finding deep, meaningful life, to finding life and life to abundance, to having this beautiful, overflowing, incredible life is losing it and trusting Jesus with it and saying, I trust you that you created me. The design that you have for me is to think about you and to think about others. And when I think about you and center my life on you and I love others the way that you loved me, I then find deep, meaningful life. And for 2018, for us to ask just a few simple questions every day, am I living by default or am I living by design? Ask yourself that every day and then also say, how can I deny my selfishness today? How can I deny my selfishness today? Because my heart will default if I allow myself to not stay connected to Jesus, I will default to selfishness. Now, I want to look through like, okay, if you think about relationships in the scriptures and the bunch of different ways that God says that family should look like and, and what these relationships would look like, there's plenty of different ways that uh, there's teachings in the scriptures that teach us how to be this family. And every single one of them is centered on how how you love them more than you care about yourself. Every single one of them. And I'll, I'll go through these and, you know, it's, it's having committing relationships, giving relationships, stewarding relationships, motivating relationships, inspiring relationships. These are throughout scripture. And you may have heard these multiple times, but let's really think about them in living, not self-centered, but others centered. Because this, Maybe the pattern for how God says that we should love him is the same exact pattern for how we should love others. If God is saying we should love him by, by think not by, sorry, if God says we should love him 
So think about the way that Jesus loved us, right? What was the main way God communicated his love to us? By sacrificing himself so that we would find ourselves, right? In humility, dying on a cross so that we might have the opportunity to walk in newness of life. It's in sacrificing himself, coming in humility, that he now has the name above every other name. That's the name of Jesus. Maybe in our own lives, the path to living and having deep, meaningful relationships, the power of great relationships is the sacrifice of yourself. And saying, how can I pour myself out as an offering to my relationships and my friendships around me? Because it's not about me. It's about what God wants to do with my life. And that's exactly how Jesus loved you. Should that not be how we love each other? Amen? So check this out. So Galatians 6, 1 and 2 talks about how a, a biblical, this is the, sorry, a design for our relationships. This is the way God designed us is to live these giving relationships. He says, brothers and sisters, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Jesus. So fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. In that language, it's talking about how can you help others? How can you think of others? How can you bear their burdens? To bear their burden means what? You've got to know what their burden is in the first place. For you to bear their burden means you've got to stop thinking about yourself and what happened to you today and pause long enough to say, how are you really doing today? To listen, to open yourself up and to say, how are you really doing? Because how many know we all love to come to church and the first thing we do when we walk in those doors is we love to lie to people. Is that not true? How you doing? I'm doing great. My life sucks. My, I'm doing great, guys. I'm not allowed to show any weakness as a Christian. <laughs> but for you to bear someone's burden means you have to actually stop thinking about yourself long enough to care about the fact that the reality is we all have a burden that we're carrying in that moment. And I love that it says bear one another's burdens because when you bear someone else's burden, that means you're linking up with someone who wants to bear your burden, right? And you're stronger together because of it. And I love this idea of saying, I will carry the weight with you. To bear your burden means I will put it on my back too. And I'm with you through this. I'm going to go through this because we all know surface level, surface level relationships are all about what happens to me. But deep, meaningful relationships are all about how can I give? And how can I be a blessing to you? You know, Pastor Reg has been teaching us this idea of stewarding, which has really kind of changed a lot of the way that I live my, a lot of the way that I live my life is because stewarding is a concept. It's a question that you ask yourself. What if what I have isn't for me, but God gave it to me so that he could give it to someone else through me? That's the stewarding concept, the stewarding mindset. What if what I have, God didn't give it to me for me, but so that God could give it to someone else through me? And you could look at this in all different aspects and in different things, but I'm going to apply it to relationships tonight. What if God brought people into your life, not for you, but so that you could do something or share the good news of Jesus Christ for them? right? Think about your work relationships and you get, I, you know, I worked, I worked all over the place. I, I painted apartments. I, and so think about the painting crew that showed up with me that day. Is those people, is those people, that's not English, maybe any of English friends, but are those people there for me or, or, I, or am I there for them? I worked in a grocery store and, and I could have been placed in produce. I could have been placed in dairy, but no, I was placed in stocking shelves. And the, my team that was there, is God giving me those relationships? Why? He's putting opportunities in there, putting opportunities there. Why? And the question is, is how are you stewarding the relationships that God has put around you? And what if what I have isn't for me, but so God, that God could reveal himself to someone else through me? And it's a beautiful thing to think that way. It's a beautiful thing to, to think that way because what I love about that is there's this old school word that I used to use, and I think it's a good word. Anybody ever hear the word divine appointment? Anybody hear that word? Divine meaning from God, appointment meaning like it was on his schedule, but it wasn't on mine. But you all of a sudden know that like this isn't a coincidence that I'm talking to you right now. 
right? Divine appointment. What if we lived our life as if every relationship we walk into is a divine appointment from God? What if we lived our life and we stopped trying to be so in control of our lives and making sure that it's all about me, that we begin to pause long enough to think, God, what are you trying to do through me? How am I being a light in the darkness? What is my calling? What is my purpose? And how do I share the good news to every relationship that you've put in my life? What are you doing through me? What are the relationships around me? How do I bear someone else's burden? And the biggest burden that they bear is the reality is that God placed eternity in our hearts and man is searching to fill that void with something and they go after all these fleeting things and we have the hope of an eternal resurrected king and we have the good news to share with everyone around us. Amen? It's, I love these, these, these concepts of, okay, all right, so maybe it's not about me. Maybe it's about what God can do through me. Another one of God's designs or concepts uh, for us in living our lives, it, our lives is, you know, we have giving, we have stewarding, we have committing relationships. Acts chapter 2 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You know, there's two big words in here, devoted and fellowship. That word fellowship is this word koinonia. It means to join together, to become family. That's this meaning, deep friendship, deep, meaningful relationships. It's used in two ways in the scriptures, with God and with each other. In this instance, it's used with each other. How did the early church devote themselves? Well, to fellowship and to teaching. Right now is teaching. In a few moments, we're going to go to small groups. That's fellowship. And I love this idea of what it ha means to have a committed relationship and committing to something. Because when I first look at my relationships and say, how do I not orchestrate this and be so in control because uh, of comfortability or, or, or anxiousness? But when I say, okay, God, what are you divinely doing with my relationships? You start thinking, okay, God, uh, whoever you put in my path, I'm going to love. I'm going to love them the same way that you loved me. Whoever it is you put in my path. I don't choose the person sitting next to me at Starbucks. I don't choose, the, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, God, I'm releasing for a moment and I'm allowing you to place them in my life. But once he places them in your life, the most beautiful thing you can ever do to somebody is say, I'm gonna be with you for the next couple months. I'm gonna be with you for the next six months through the thick and through the thin. I am committing to you that I'm not walking away from you. In fact, I'm gonna bug you until you're upset with me. That's how much I'm gonna love you. And people may be like, okay, that's kind of weird at the front. Like, like, let's be honest, let's figure that out to say that the right way. But it, deep down inside, don't you want somebody who's not just going to love you for what you can give them, but they're loving you because of what they've received from God? Too many of our relationships are all about auditioning for each other. I'm going to audition and put my best self forward. And if I audition and you like it, you'll let me play the part of friend in your life. Too many of our relationships start that way. And instead of auditioning and trying to earn relationships, receive the relationships that God puts in your life. Because maybe, just maybe, God's in control. <laughs> and when you commit, you also say, I recognize that I'm gonna make a mistake. Again, this is, we're not thinking selfishly, we're thinking others first. When you commit, say, for instance, we're gonna do small groups here in a minute, and you're gonna get brand new small groups tonight. The small group you were in last fall, uh, that is a season that is behind us. And tonight, you get a brand new small group. And we're gonna say, do you want to be committed to this small group for six months? And one of the cool things about that is when you say, I'm gonna to commit to this for six months, it says this, I understand that I'm gonna make a mistake between now and six months. Is that fair, right? Like, even as your pastor, I'm going to make a mistake between now and the next six minutes, right? <laughs> right? So we understand that it's inevitable that we're going to make a mistake. And when you commit to something like that, you know what that communicates to them? You don't have to audition for me. You can make mistakes in front of me. It's okay. Because I'm not perfect either. It's a me too moment. Me too. But because of the love I've received from God, I want to love you. Now let's figure this out together. Let's stay connected to Jesus together. Don't you want that? Someone who's committed to you so you can be committed to them and an incredible biblical friendship so that you grow. And then finally, inspiring and motivating. Hebrews chapter 10. I love this. 
my favorite part of, of biblical friendships. It says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another the more all, all, and, and as, oh my gosh, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is this saying? Let's consider how can we inspire and motivate each other? How do we inspire and motivate each other? To have a, God's design, inspiring and motivating relationships. When you aren't living self-centered and you're living other-centered, it gives you the freedom to inspire people, to, to find the smallest thing in their life and say, that is incredible. You do that better than anyone I know. I love that about you. Find the tiniest little thing. I love that about you. I'm literally writing this, finishing the, the details of this sermon this morning and, and changing it up a little bit for 412 tomorrow night. And, and as I'm writing this, there's a woman across from me in Starbucks because, you know, we don't have a church right now. So we got to like, everyone's operating out of craziness. And there's a woman in front of me. She's giving this advice. And I think she's the Starbucks manager. And she's talking about how you need to communicate to the people that you're leading in a way that is most likely for them to be received. And I'm like, this girl's killing it right now. She's like, this is great advice. Advice. So I popped on my earbud and I said, hey, this may come off as crazy, but I just want you to know you're giving some great advice right now and you're good at what you do. Don't ever stop. And I was like, why don't I do this more often? Why, why am I not just thinking about when I get into an environment, how can I spread the love of God? Because I get it every day from him. Why am I not giving it to someone else through me, right? Why am I not looking at it and saying, what are my opportunities right now? Who's being marginalized? Who's being left out? How can I look to them and say, here's what I love about you. You are one of the most endearing people I've ever met. You, your smile lights up a room. You are incredible. You look nice. You dress nice. Why am I so self-conscious that I can't just live in such a way to say, I have found my identity in Christ. I know who I am in him. And so it gives me the freedom to say, how do I find something in you to bring out of you so that I can point to you the good news of Jesus Christ? How can I live in such a way as this? It's inspiring and it's joyous to lose yourself, to not walk into Starbucks and be like, how do I open my Bible and my highlighter and be like, someone talk to me about God. You talk to them about God. What are the relationships he's put into your life? And so this is God's design for us. Stop auditioning, start contributing to their growth. You audition, it's all about me. You contribute to their growth, it's all about them. And how can you identify and inspire them, but then also motivate them. The, the number one key for developing a deep, meaningful friendship with somebody is to be, to be the friend to them that you want them to be to you, regardless of what they do to you. Be the friend to them that you want them to be to you. I don't care if we live in no text back Texas, right? I get that, right? And, and, or Snapchat or whatever you people do these days. All I'm saying is, is if you find so much of your identity in Christ, it doesn't matter what others do to you because you get that from him. You can do unto others as you would want others to do unto you, regardless of what they do to you. Be the friend to them that you want them to be to you. You wanna have an incredible young adult ministry? Be the type of person that would reflect an incredible young adult ministry. And if we can get 100 beautiful, incredible, passionate, Jesus-loving young adults who want to be the type of people that we want others to be to us, there will begin a movement in Southeast Texas for the name of Jesus Christ unlike ever before. So begin to own it and say, I wanna be the type of friend that I want others to be to me. Don't you want this? So everything that I've said today, there's no, I'm not saying that you're going to go in there and be like, I, I want my friend to be this. No, you be this. And if we all own that a little bit today, because here's the thing I know about my Jesus. He's the one who looks up in the tree. He's the one who looks behind the table. He's the one who goes out of his way. He's the one who looks for the brokenhearted. He's the one who looks for the sick. He's the one who took me, a little kid from a town of 6,000 people in back of nowhere, Pennsylvania, and said, I believe in you, Jimmy. You can do great things. He's the one who looks to the one who, he's the one who leaves the 99 and goes finds the one, right, Jordan, right? He's the one. She just got that tattoo. 
I just want to be like my Jesus who's shown me a love that goes beyond anything that I could ever even imagine. And I want us to develop deep, meaningful relationships. And if we lose our life for his sake, we will find it. Amen. Amen. Stand. Let me pray for you. As we sing a few songs in response to who God is and what he's done in our lives, I, I want you to be in prayer about God reveal my heart, those default mode of my heart to where it's all about me and my relationships. God, give me a love for others the same way that you have a love for others. And maybe, just maybe, the next unexpected relationship in your life is the one that changes you and grows you deeper than you've ever grown in your life before. Whether that's Jesus and you've never met him, or you have met Jesus and tonight, you truly want to be like your Jesus. We're gonna sing a few songs, we're gonna think deeply, we're gonna worship accordingly. Then I'll be back up to lead you to what we're doing after that. God, thank you for speaking. God, thank you for finding us. God, thank you for speaking life into us. God, thank you for loving us. God, thank you for your grace. God, thank you for dying for us without even asking us or making us do anything, but just offering this free gift of love. God, we respond. We respond by loving you and loving others the way that you've loved us. So God, be glorified in everything that's said and done. Love Jesus, amen? Amen, love you guys.